I'm well, thanks, David. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm looking forward to the chat. Uh, will you give us a bit of an intro into, I suppose, who you are as as both an athlete and a coach and uh, a person, I suppose? Yeah. So, so right now, I'm probably uh, filling a couple of whole, a uh, couple of couple of roles. I would say um, I'm a professional fighter and a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, but I also coach um, amateur mixed martial arts and sort of a youth project, which is something that I'm quite passionate about, sort of the grassroots level of the sport. Um, and I'm also a strength and conditioning coach by, by trade and, and qualification as well. Um, but before that, I was also a sports therapist. So my initial degree was a sports therapy degree. So I have a slight appreciation for sort of the, the injury side of things as well. Um, and that's kind of been... Um, it's all kind of been inter- interlinked along the way. Like I've always coached a little bit. I've always been at uni or been doing further courses a little bit. And I've always been fighting for about the past 12 years now. Um, and it's kind of all, all meshed together to, to where I'm at now. Yeah. I forgot that you were a sports therapist, actually. I forgot you had told me that before. That was the start of your journey. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first. It's actually a weird one because I didn't do any... Um, sort of formal education after school I went into sort of an apprenticeship initially uh, I didn't have the the grades or, or points to do physiotherapy or strength and conditioning which is what I wanted to do back then so to get the the uni in Birmingham that I could get into uh, was sports therapy so that's what I did in hindsight now it's uh, I'm really glad I did because it gave me a bit of a larger scope of of understanding um, than perhaps just doing sports science or uh, SNC. yeah and did you did you why did you why were you interested in getting into all of the worlds in, in training and all of that stuff? Was that because it was that fundamentally or initially because of your own training? Yeah, I'd like to say it was like to, to be the best coach. But back then it was um, I, I was just about to turn professional as a fighter. Um, I, was, I was actually a, a BT open reach engineer um, until I was 19. Um, so climbing telephone poles and running cables. Um, <laughs> In the daytime, uh, but but I always had a, I always was quite well read. I always used to read a lot about training, and I wanted to to sort of one, it would help my own career, and then number two, um, it would be a way to earn a, a living alongside competing a little bit easier, and to be able to give my all to competing. So it was probably pretty selfishly at the start, and then it's kind of over the years, it's kind of swinged the other way a little bit now. Now I try and learn to help my clients more than myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same here. Same here. No, I'm not a professional athlete now, but um, <laughs> but back at back in the day, I was. That's why I got into this because it was my own body I was interested in. And then, at one stage, it swung, and I was like ne- completely neglecting myself, and then helping other people. And then I was like, I forgot why I was doing it in the first place, and and that. But um, but yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Lear- you're kind of learning on the job then, especially when you're applying th- things to yourself. You know. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, I wish I could listen to my own advice sometimes, I suppose it's probably similar to yourself, as in uh, over the years, there's, there's mistakes I've made myself that I would always tell other people not to do. But my emotional bias kicks in and I, <laughs> I end up making all the mistakes myself anyway with injuries and, and things of that nature, which I'm sure we'll, we'll kind of get onto as, as we go mm-hmm. through. Mm-hmm. What, um, I watched your fight recently. When, when was, was that last week? uh it's about 10 days ago now a week sunday a week sunday just gone yeah i tuned in i tuned in me and kira were in dublin we were actually meant to go to switzerland for a few days and then the covid stuff we were like now nah, we're not going to go because we could get stuck over there our all our tests and stuff like that so we just went to dublin for a few days and um we were after arriving up we got into the hotel room we we're like oh we'll go down to the bar for a few drinks and i was like we'll just watch chris's fight first <laughs> so so uh <laughs> So yeah, that was good. It was a good win. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I'm, I'm always a little bit critical on performance, but in hindsight, now looking back, yeah, it was a, it was a solid win to win to win every round. So um, it's quite cool. I was actually surprised with the, with the streaming service because because the show the show is growing. I think they're on about getting a deal with um, UFC Fight Pass down the line or, or something along that, that nature. But I was actually surprised how many people from friends around the world actually tuned in on the the stream. I was mm-hmm. like, that's pretty cool. Like people going, oh, we watched your fight. And I was thinking, uh, I, I was pretty surprised, but actually quite a lot of people did sort of buy the stream and tune in, which was quite nice, you know. Yeah. Do you think Instagram helps with that? Like you putting up your, your stuff on Instagram, like I wouldn't obviously know you from other ways or you wouldn't know me probably. Um, 
like does you does you posting little things along the way help with your fighting career do you think or give you better opportunities or not not yet yeah i think so, so like i don't know whether you've even know, you probably have noticed but i've had over the years probably three or four instagram accounts where <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not the I'm not the I'm not the, I'm not a criminal. I'm just uh, I'm not the biggest fan of social media, to to be honest. But um, you know, I feel if I'd have kept my old accounts, I'd probably have a, a reasonably big following around now. I mean, it's not it's okay now, but um, it does help and it does massively help with opportunity with business. Um, and, and you are spreading the kind of if, I think as long as you can use it well and like um, you know, I only follow things that. Uh, improve my life now I sort of mm. under, that's something I find I try not to look at the other stuff or have input on stuff even if it's other coaches that frustrate you or athletes that annoy you or just you, your friends who are a bit toxic at times I just try not to uh, avoid it and try and just view stuff that makes my life better and um it definitely helps from a branding perspective from a and from a fighting perspective um in terms of uh having interest yeah it's powerful social media is powerful you just can't let it you have to make sure it's working for you rather than the other way around like you know i'm the same as you there I, I could i follow way too many people but i've hidden a lot of people now that i just don't want to see on my feed even if i think the odd post is good if it's like if it's just annoying me for some reason like i find, catch myself that i'm like in a in kind of bad form after looking at that post or that person's head or something <laughs> then they're just gone because it's not worth it yeah, yeah exactly, exactly that exactly that. but it does help with the uh with the fights and and I've had a little bit of a laugh, but the support was was really good at that. Like from from people online to even like I think I had about 150 go uh, just locally, just friends, family, teammates, people that know me, which was for a, for a fairly smallish show. That was re- like really cool, you know. Yeah, and that was your first fight back in how long? Two two years. I fought on Cage Warriors uh, two years ago. It's just just a little over two years to this one now. Yeah, and why the why the why the break? Because I know when I spoke to you, it's probably, it's, when I first spoke to you, it's probably two years ago, close to two years ago. And you are, you are officially retired at that stage. And I think you've been unretired and unretired a few times since then, like your Instagram accounts. Yeah, it's, um, so, so when I, when I originally uh, retired was, uh, I had, I had Bell's palsy, which I've, I've talked about a little bit on, on some bits, but I had, um. But I was palsy after one of my fights, and uh, so I couldn't close my, I couldn't move my face on the one side. Um, no sort of uh, long-term damage as such, but obviously I, I couldn't fight at that point in time, which is what led me to start in the master's degree in uh, strength and conditioning. Actually, just to sort of uh, chuck my myself into something positive, um, something I wanted to do after my career, but I ended up doing sort of midway through. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I come back and fought because I wanted that was just for kind of personal achievement. So that was two years ago and then I was just juggling too much with sort of business uni um training but like the level I compete at it's you know international it's not the absolute pinnacle yet but it's it's pretty pretty far up there you know like you know European top European level um and uh it was just got a bit much of like having to make a choice of what I wanted to do um so I kind of did go into the coaching role and and I was sort of um doing a good job and, and and it was fulfilling to a degree but there was still something a little bit missing and then of course covid covid was going on at the same time so like because of that um the only thing we were actually able to do was go and train with the other professionals because we had this like elite status in the city to be able to train mm-hmm. so the one thing that was keeping me sane couldn't see my friends couldn't see my family couldn't see my girlfriend at the time couldn't see mm-hmm. anything like that and it was like um i could go and train with the pros every morning Mm-hmm. so it kept me sane but while I'm doing that they're fighting on you know one of the lads has just got to the UFC Jay Cadley but he won the cage warriors world title along the way Aiden Lee and Jai are in UFC and Bellator and they're they're having fantastic performances and I'm training with them and I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of me is happy for them and a little bit of me is like I want in on some of that yeah um, so I've spoke to my close friends and it was like well I'm 30 now so it's now or never athletically really so yeah. I'm giving myself a, a few years ahead now to try and achieve what I can and have the experiences I can to to then sort of uh, pull it all together when I retire into into coaching yeah do you think you're more do you think that break helped you in some ways or hindered you in some ways or do you think you're a better athlete now or a worse athlete or do you think time like like was did you feel rusty in that in that fight um, I feel I feel like uh, I feel like the break was good for me mentally. Um, 
I'd never really took a break at all in 10. And I still never really took a break, to be honest. I, I, I train because it's just, that's just what I do. Um, mm -hmm. So I was still on the mats a lot. I was still wrestling a lot. I was still doing jiu-jitsu a lot. I just wasn't getting hit in the head through the whole time. Um, she was a good thing, right? That's a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would say like, I'm a, I'm a better, and I addressed actually coming to the point of, of, of me sort of speaking to you and, and our consultations through that time was um, I sort of addressed to the best of my ability some of the, the orthopedic issues I had. Um, so that combined with uh, really harnessing my grappling, I feel I've come back um, a very, very good grappler, um, but I'm just having to uh, piece together the, the timing and the, the distance on the striking a little bit more because although I was hitting pads during my break, I wasn't sparring. Um, whereas in wrestling and jiu-jitsu, I was going live wrestling all the time for two years. Mm -hmm. So it's just bridging that gap a little bit on that and, and it's getting better and better all of the time again. Um, so, but I think it, all things considered, I didn't get in the head, hit in the head for two years, yeah. really. Um, uh I was able to improve my grappling. I got my black belt in jiu-jitsu in that time. Uh, and I sort of got to address some of my um, deficiencies sort of from a movement standpoint and from an injury standpoint um, to the best, like I say, to the best of my ability, which, so I think in, in all in all, like it's a bit cliche, but everything for a reason, it's brought me to yeah. quite a good point now. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, can you tell us a bit about maybe some of your injuries over the years? Like you don't have to go into detail, but I suppose what, um, or you can go into whatever detail you want, but like what my main thing is what, what, what you've learned from your injuries in terms of like how you now train versus maybe how you did in the past. Uh, and then I suppose the second part of that question is what you've learned in terms of how you now apply that to the athletes that you coach and, what what lessons that you you've learned from your injuries and and what things you can or you do need to do and you definitely don't need to do as much of yeah so um just on, on the injuries in general something that, that was quite apparent was like most of the injuries i got are, or the, the the sequences that led to the injuries and obviously the, the always multifactorial but the the key ones was like i was doing things i didn't need to be doing was was fundamental it's the thing i try and say to my athletes like is what you're doing making you making yourself better so i can like there's numerous injuries i've, I've picked up doing extra conditioning circuits or doing extra drills or things that didn't need to necessarily be done to make me better i was doing them because of just my pig-headedness of like work rate work rate work rate. I, I perhaps didn't have a guide guiding me oh don't do that you fought last week have a week mm -hmm. off have a rest but i was back in the gym and, and quite a lot of my injuries come from doing things that I just didn't really need to be doing. Um, fortunately, most of them have healed now. Um, but the big thing that kind of, um, that kind of your, your kind of um, philosophy sort of changed with me was uh, I had quite bad lower back pain for a period of time. And, and it was for a very long time, actually. Uh, the, again, it was more factual. I was traveling to London quite a lot um, from Birmingham. So, and then sparring and then getting the chain back to Birmingham. So it wasn't just a case of whatever the movement was doing. It was a sort of lifestyle a little bit as well. It's everything. Um, yeah. but, 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 but while I, while I was doing to sort of, um, hide whatever was going on was, you know, everything was, was dead focused on like a neutral spine, flat back lifting. So like loads of deadlifts, RDLs, everything was just in that perfect sort of what, what we deem perfect posture, which, which is not, um but really hammering that because i could do it pain free um but what that led to is like uh hip restriction like uh, 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 from a childhood of football i've got some restrictions of mobility um and it kind of just amplified that mm -hmm. because i was just locking down my lower back all of the time to do these movements because they didn't really cause pain and it kind of led to the point and then i had a had an injury doing something just innocuous just a general kicking drill before a training session uh, and led to like a groin injury um, at the time. And it, it was clear like while I was doing just forcing like RDL squats, deadlifts, pull-ups, bench press, don't be wrong, I still prescribe them for everyone, mm -hmm. but just forcing that um, sort of amplified my um, sort of hip issues and low back issues. You know, I was literally, and I probably wasn't doing, again, I wasn't RDLing great at the time. You know, it was like locking into extension because flexion hurt at the time, yeah. You know, which, which you so say it wasn't an RDL done well. It was just I'm lacking into extension to compensate mm -hmm. for going into to flexion mm -hmm. pain. Um, what you said there a minute ago was the 
like everything done done perfect quote unquote like in terms of neutral spine but when you start to learn you're like a neutral spine isn't an extended spine it's, yeah exactly you know and that's what i think that's what we're not taught as as people who just first enter the gym and train and as maybe coaches it, it's people think that uh, like the most extension i can get out of my spine or a flat back is a neutral spine it is not a neutral spine we have a kyphotic curve and a lordotic curve and it's not that neutral is good or bad it's just you should we we're just we just have we're just not very clear on what what actually is what a spine movement is what a hip hinge actually is versus what just extending my back all the time actually is yeah absolutely absolutely that and even when we look at like our images on social media of people lifting most of what we see is people doing the exact exactly that like in in lumbar extension or looking up and you see and okay some some lifts may require an amount of that like olympic weightlifting but mm-hmm. if that's your sport that's your sport okay um but every every lift certainly doesn't need to be driving that like bent over if you if your program starts to become rdls bent over rows bench press you're obviously you, you're continually training that same which is fine but you need to do some of the other stuff as well uh, which is the, that's the big thing in terms of my own physical development that, that i've sort of I've picked up on over the years so since then working with you and sort of get i think i would i'd still do the, the, the other movements that's the thing but getting a, a better balance of sort of um training uh, like my mobility has gone up gone up drastically i'm not really in pain at all at the moment um obviously if i really start ragdolling my body i'm 30 years of age i've done combat sports for 12 years i'm always going to get niggles but um so the, the main issues i was i was having have kind of subsided mm-hmm. um and it's a case of giving the body a little bit a little bit of, of different different stimuluses there mm-hmm. um and not being in pain has improved my mobility more than all the f- fancy mobility drills i can tell you because that was the next route I went was you looking at these abstract and, and MMA in particular and jujitsu is full of these abstract mobility gurus doing these crazy movements and mm-hmm. um, which I haven't, you know, I don't think that's great for performance either personally, but you see some really crazy stuff and then you start doing it and you go, well, I'm, I don't have the prerequisites to, to do these things um, and they just cause more pain. Yeah. Um, so I actually found like doing a lot of the stuff we did together and it's very similar to some of your products that you've got um but a little bit more nuanced to me um mm-hmm. sort of made my hip movement way better um which is and then in turn has given me way more uh, tools when i'm competing again mm-hmm. i don't want people and i don't want people to listen to this saying i'm asking you that question so you say or oh, like or oh, you really helped me it's like anyone who looks at chris's stuff or anything like that will see that he's an incredibly smart coach and these are just these are just principles like that you can apply across the board in terms of it's just getting getting a bit smarter with my exercise selection or my my coaching of some of the lifts and things like that and you're a good example of someone who is in like when I watched you in that fight like you physically dominated him like there was no comparison there and when I see you you're still lifting you're still you're still pushing things hard but it's just understanding where that line is and where maybe too much is too much. And if you're a bodybuilder or you're a weightlifter, that's fine. But when you're, when, when your sport is outside of that, like you said, there, feeling good is one of the most important things you can do is probably the most important thing you can do. And even if you're chasing output, you want more out, motor output, more motor output. If you feel like shit, your nervous system probably isn't going to give you that motor output that you want. It doesn't matter how much you push. You just feel like shit and it won't give it to you. So feeling good, people, I don't pe- think people understand how important that actually is. And sometimes that's not finding the new drill. That's just taking away the noxious stimulus, the stimulus that like something just makes me feel like shit. And I just stop doing a little bit of that. And I just, I don't have to add in all these drills. I just stop doing the thing that's making me feel like shit. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something I do that, that you talk about what, what kind of goes with my clients now that that's kind of the biggest takeaway, like, and in my own training. So for example, like I don't back squat anymore. Um, and I do also think there's something to be said for training age, as in if you've lifted weight as an athlete, this is, but if you've lifted weights and you've done your, you, you, you know, your two and a half body weight deadlift and your, or that, you know, we have these, uh, standards people throw about and they're, that the tongue in cheek really, but mm-hmm. there exists. And, you know, once you've got a decent strength base, 
you know, most of the thing is, is don't don't mess it up. Don't don't mess your body up. So, you know, when you're strong and you're deadlifting two and a half body weight or and you're going a, or triple body weight and you're doing 85 percent, that's very taxing on your body to then go into jujitsu, wrestling, MMA on top of it. Mm-hmm. If someone's relatively weak, it's not that much of a stress on the system. Just, mm-hmm. you know, it's the same way uh, I've got friends who are sprinters and sprint coaches when they do a track session two sessions a week they're obliterated you know because they run at very high intensities fighters can run sprints three four days i mean i don't think they should but they can and they're recovered because the truth of the matter is they're not running that fast at that in that high intensity so they have a, an easier ability to, and i feel the same with with um strength training with, with combat sports i feel mm-hmm. um what i'm saying now might not be applicable to you guy who's got a real, real like I think you put some up before, and it was like you need to be strong enough. And some guys aren't strong enough, and no. that needs to be their entire focus if they wanna sit at the table and compete at a high level. Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly as you get a, a higher training age, like I said, picking your exercise selection, like I, said, I don't back squat anymore, but um a safety bar split squat might do the job for me. Um I don't deadlift too much from the floor, but an RDL or a trap bar might work well for me. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it, it, it's just those little nuances. And I, I can identify it with a client a lot easier now. When someone goes, my hip pinches when I do this, I can go, okay, let's check your internal external rotation of your hip. What, how are you moving? What are you feeling? Okay, well, well maybe we might come back to it, but we can get the same stimulus from this exercise or this exercise. Like you say, athletes need stimulus, not a, a, a power lifter squat or a Olympic lift. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Your hamstring doesn't know what lift you're doing. It just knows, it just knows stress basically. So yeah. And that goes for every part of the body. And yeah, that's, I think sometimes people, when they see me talking maybe about biomechanics or, or different things like this, they think that like I'm against strength training, like, because just because of that, but like, it shouldn't be one or the other, like all of these things just inform each other and, and help you make better decisions about your training. And then you can get, you can get as strong as you want or as you need. And, and hopefully along the way, you're just not robbing other qualities that you will need at some point. And like, you're right about them younger athletes. A lot, a lot, like even you 10 years ago and stuff like that, you can do all of these lifts probably, but would you have done as much of them knowing what you know now? Maybe not, but I still would have done them. But like, I might've had other things sprinkled in along the way or a bit more variation in my training and things like that. And that's, I think that's what people miss is that just because it feels good now doesn't mean I should do as much as possible as I can of it. Cause I might be robbing my future self of something that it's going to need at some stage. Yeah, absolutely. And I could say that work from, from my perspective, I see it work in two ways because from what I see in, in a lot of um, fighters is you tend to see one or the other. So you tend to see someone who's just, they do strength training. They have um, phenomenal results early. And in, in six months to a year, they're a completely different athlete to what they mm-hmm. were. And and especially when you're around the 18, 19, 20 year old mark, you, you know, with, with your hormones as well, you just, you go from a boy to a man in 12 months. I have it with a, a buck. So I've worked with for about a year. Uh, and I think we get the nice blend now. You just won the national championships in, in the elite category. Um, so real big achievement for him. But I've seen him go from a boy to a man in 12 months. And I think um, what what you can sometimes get with that is, is when you're doing like strength training, you have such big results, you then put more and more time into that and thinking that you're going to get like compound results, you're going to get more and more and more results. Mm-hmm. It actually like stagnates a little bit. Mm-hmm. So you tend to see that guy and they're the guys everyone's going you know, they're in the gym, they're strung, the rest, they're probably wrestling top game. Everyone's thinking they're on the juice because all they do is lift weights. And then you got the, the polar opposite where you got the guy who's doing so much abstract mobility and not strengthening sort of even, even like I say, like your mobility drills aren't the strength drills. You know, a lot of, a lot of the time there's a combination where they're doing so much abstract mobility. Um, they then reach a point where they compete and they're just getting ragdolled and, and then they have to go, oh, I've got to do something different. Yeah. And then what you tend to get is they both end up in the same places. The guy who did mobility realizes he has to do strength and if he wants to succeed. And the guy who did loads and loads of strength starts breaking, which was me. That was me. <laughs> and then he goes, he's got to do some something else um, to be able to exist for the long haul and not just be great two or three years and then you're injured and then you quit. 
Yeah, but that makes sense. It's just logical, right? It's the same as in, like, and I know nothing about fighting apart from probably getting beaten up a few times when I had a few <laughs> more too many drinks. But like, I presume if you focus too heavily on your striking versus your grappling, like there's going to be gaps there or vice versa or whatever the hell it is. Like you're, you you need to have a balance of, of all of these things, especially especially as a high level athlete. There's very few sports where maybe maybe if you look at some of the American sports, like some of the guys in the in, in, in American football, like they have a very, very, very specialized job, like the offensive lineman or whatever. It's just like, do not get moved. <laughs> do yeah. not turn, just push straight into a guy and get, see who can get lower. Like they have a very specialized job, but apart from that, there's very few sports that are as specialized as that. And I think, um, I think in what I see of S and C, it is changing, but that was what obviously while a lot of program, we like to sort of uh, romanticize American football programs mm-hmm. for, for all sports then because they're fast, they're explosive, they're big, they're strong, they're, you know, the, the ideal athlete, we look at some, some of it. Um, and, and but we, we tend to correspond with like, you know, some of these guys are taking such high collisions. They don't have a ton of mobility. The, their literally job is to not be moved. Yeah. But unless that's your job, which is not most sports, there needs to be more to a program than like, just what what those guys do mm-hmm. um and i think that's where like even in snc you're starting to see now like uh, some of the uh, other guests you mentioned on like here grandma grandma does a lot with the muay thai guys and i think he has a combination probably in a similar similar to where i'm at is it's, it's a combination of everything like from plyometrics to some of the mobility drills to some to isometrics to traditional snc they're still mm-hmm. trapped by deadlifting. They're still doing chin ups and bench press. It's just there's everything else sprinkled in, and it's about it's just balance, isn't it? Really? Yeah. yeah. That must be an exciting time then for you. I suppose it's more so as a coach then looking at what, like how this sport is going to develop because it probably hasn't had that much S and C over the years, and now it's it's going to explode. Obviously, as the money and the and the opportunities are there, it's going to become more and more professional and. Um, what's what's um, what's your plan then, coaching wise, over the next few years? What are you gonna? I know it's hard to say while you're fighting, but what are you gonna try and build, or what's the what's the plan with regards to where you're training people, and then the online stuff, and your coaching program, and your young athletes? What what are you working on? So just on, uh, yeah, I think the next, I'd say the last two years, there's been more development in fighters than there's been in the last ten. Mm-hmm. The, the kids coming through are. Um, they can do everything at a super high level now. Uh, you know, the guys who kind of from my generation who are still around, it's because they were a bit forward thinking because many now are, are just cannot keep up with what's what's coming through. The level of skill from 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 kids starting younger um, has just has just changed the, the landscape of the sport. Um, from from my side of, as a coach and as a as a business and as an athlete, um, it's funny I've actually wrote up this week because I've had a bit of downtime, like a five year, three year one year plan motivational motivational week just in terms of planning out the the what's coming up um so i'd like to have a an amateur mma cell which is kind of what i've got running and sort of run towards the, we, there's something called now called the the imamaf championships which are sort of like our the not a governing body but that they're kind of like the most prestigious amateur event we have so it would be our olympics or our um like uh world championships in boxing or judo whatever it is so um, and sort of trying to produce some champions towards that from from the grassroots right the way up. So from like taking a guy on who's just started training right the way through. That's something to, to sort of like amateur world championships. That's something I'm, I'm very passionate about and something that uh, I want to try and build. Um, and then alongside that, um, trying to build the online brand a little bit more um, in terms of providing SNC for for predominantly combat sports athletes. Um, Sort of inter- internationally, I've already I work with quite a lot of athletes this year. Probably, I mean, not not astronomical numbers, but like one on a one to one basis online. I work with about forty athletes this year, and oh, nice. some, it's worked quite well. And and we've had some some very good results. And that's not down to necessarily myself. It, it, it's just a very small piece of of what they're doing. Um, but it does seem to be uh, very popular and very very successful so far. And I think because of the um, the sport isn't the most well paid. So having one to I do do one to one coaching locally. Um, but unless you've got a sponsor or a high income, it, the bottom line is for a lot of MMA fighters, it's not affordable. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Whereas having, so then what they re, uh, have to do is go and train with the mate who's a PT, who's doing all kinds of crazy stuff because they can't afford coaching. So the, the remote services is a way that they can get a uh, high end coaching. It's not just me, there's many coaches doing it who are, who are very well qualified. Um, but I think that's a great way for fighters to work because they're going to get at least high level tuition um, while they can't afford it. Because un unless you're like at the absolute pinnacle, even at European level, you, 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 you're not making a ton. Yeah. Is that then, is that then just like you, you would meet them in the beginning online, write them a program and then just kind of tweak it as you go along and every, every month you write a new program type of thing or like what, what, um, how does that become more affordable for them and, and still lucrative enough, lucrative enough for you as a, as, as a business without taking up too much of your time? So, so this year now, because the capacity has been so full, I've kind of had to scale a little bit in that way. So I've got like a generic program running that's going to start this this coming year. That's just kind of going to be like, it's going to change monthly to kind of align with probably pretty much what a lot of people are, like hobbyists who want to change jiu-jitsu. They have competitions, but they're not, they're not cutting 10 kilos and peaking for one day. They're just, they're experiencing competition. They're training year round and just a balanced program that can fulfill that need for, for those people. Yeah. But then having a bit more of a, an, a, a higher price point on some of the sort of one-to-one. -one. Yeah. Um, and I'd say some to the highest tier is almost like a mentorship where I will speak to them about the train, their overall training plan, sort of my experiences as a fighter. What, where does everything fit together? Not just here's your two SNC sessions a week, away you go. Mm -hmm. um but but for that reason exactly that that it had to be financially viable because the, i realized this year working people that i can't be giving micro adjustments weekly whatsapp no. conversations on a friday night um with people who are on the lowest price point because i'm uh, because of my nature as well i, I will do it yeah so that's okay. why I asked because I was like, I could see you like answering questions all day long and not getting paid for it. So I was like, <laughs> so it kind of had to go. Okay, well, like that's that's kind of what I've done at the close of play this year is just have a have a couple of different options where if you want full access, it's there. If you want just a plan, it's there, yeah. and they are what they are. Rather than uh, when the wall is a little muddy, it's like it is your text and I'll reply and I'm thinking shouldn't be doing that on a Friday night really or on a, on a so just having a bit of boundaries and then the people that, that pay for the services you won't someone said to me a good thing but it was like you won't resent your clients then because mm -hmm. if, you, if someone just milks you milks you milks you for whatever you're doing um there could be a resentment on a, on a on a coach kind of relationship and that's not good for anyone I want to help people but obviously you need to feel valued as well so I've kind of that's been a big change coming coming into the new year yeah yeah look I think I think whatever you do, you're going to be, you're going to be good because you have a ton of specific knowledge. The thing that people don't, people forget when they go too much into the business stuff initially, and they're trying to figure things out and the branding and the Instagram and blah, blah, blah. It's all tactics, tactics, kind of like, how am I going to build my profile? And what they don't have initially in the first place is a ton of specific knowledge. So I am really good at something and then I can leverage that thing and leveraging that thing isn't easy but it's much easier than building the specific knowledge in the first place and specific knowledge has come in your case from years and years of training and making mistakes and education and all of these things and then leveraging that is going to be is going to be fine even if you make a mistake business wise like i have like i, I give too much time to some clients or I, I have the wrong price point that can be fixed quite quickly if you really if, when, when as soon as you bring awareness to it but uh, but building the specific specific knowledge is the hard part. So that's why I'm excited for you because it's going to be a cool a cool journey business wise, I suppose. Yeah, that, and that's something that like uh, I haven't had. Um, we we don't get we don't get taught. So like even though I see how obviously how how yourself runs. Um, I've did recently done something with Will Wade and like a mentorship he had. He's a, a very prominent SNC coach in the in the UK. What's uh, his name? William Wayland. Oh yeah, he he's friends with Kier as well, is he? Friends with Kier, but Kier's just, friends with everyone. <laughs> every everyone, every yeah, he pretty much is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we're that kind of except the UKSCA. Yeah. <laughs> and John Seedman. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's it's that uh sort of uh that you don't get taught business, and that's the thing that I'm trying to learn a little bit along the way now in terms of how to because uh, there is a skill set there to to be to be used, and he's just trying to um kind of uh 
put the right things in place that you can help. And like you said yourself as well, it's like you, you, you end up, that's the only way you can help a lot of people. Like yeah. I see yourself out, thousands of now found certain programming, but unless you put yourself out there to show that, then people don't get helped. And so mm. it, every everyone wins by that, right? Yeah, well, yeah. It's Look, it's one of them where, I'm like you, people don't realize it probably we're, we're similar in the way that like, I, I would rather not put myself out there a lot of the time. Sometimes I've, in the past, I've definitely had to force myself to do that a little bit. I'd rather just do my own thing a lot of the time, but like, because especially, I don't know, is it an Irish thing, but like people will put you down as much as they possibly can if they think that you're getting ahead of your station or like I'm putting myself out there, this type of thing. People will really try and put you down uh, or talk behind your back and stuff like that. But then if you're not doing it just because of those people, like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You're just hurting yourself in the long run, you know? So I, I just think if you're doing something that you believe is good, you believe is helping people, then putting yourself out there and trying to build a business and leverage off that is fine. If you're confident, I, I, this, I'm doing this to the best of my ability. And this is what I really believe right now. It's the people who are putting themselves out there and like, they're just selling snake oil they're the people that people should have the problem with but they just kind of lump everyone in that same boat at the same time and that's that's uh there's no nuance to that conversation then yeah yeah you know so so you shouldn't have deleted them instagram accounts (laughs) (laughs) what uh what's your off season looking like now or going to look like or um, is it an off season would you call it an off season I would because of of, of uh, an injury. I've just got a, I've got a heal up over, over Christmas. But um, mm-hmm. if not, I would have probably gone back into some pretty reasonable training straight away. Um, just just to, well, you know, most of the shows are probably looking at March kind of time. It looks like on a timeline. Mm-hmm. So it's about 12, 12 weeks from now, maybe. So um, off season wise, is is it? is trying to make myself just feel good before I return to sort of hard. It's kind of what we talked about really mm-hmm. um, from, pro- from programming perspective, it's kind of a combination of, of some of your drills and isometrics and things and a one by 20 program. Um, that's kind of going to run for the next sort of three to six weeks. Um, how, many, how many days a week would you do a one by 20? Because I'm not on the mats as much as normal. I'm coaching and I'm drilling, but I'm not, I'm not doing as much intense work. I'm doing it three days. Mm-hmm. Um, but generally when I'm in camp or just when I'm training a lot, I think two days is enough mm-hmm. of, of programming for SNC. Yeah. Um, exercise like, wise, exercise wise, what would that look like? Like what moving from one to the next? So this is some I spoke to actually message care about. I'm one of his Q and A's because I've obviously obviously read the book, read the program, you look online and there's like 30 exercises and they're just not practical to do in the mm-hmm. gym. So it tends to be like a, a squat pattern or a, or a lunge pattern, a hinge pattern or a thrust pattern push, pull, push, pull, something trunk related. Um, at the minute, a little bit of arms uh, tucked in there as well. Um, and then and then I kind of finished the session with, uh, so it tends to be about 10 exercises, generally like, like a, a lunge or squat, a hinge, push, pull, push, pull, trunk, and then arms and uh, a, sh- a shoulder isolation exercise, say. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I finish with some of the isometrics we've done, so like hamstring bridge, split squat iso, things of that nature, mm-hmm. Copenhagen's. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, and yeah, like um, you feel good after it. It's obviously going to um, set the foundations for some future work down the line. Yeah. Um, I've done it in the past and, and uh, found it a bit awkward to do with like the, the large exercise selection. So I feel like sort of that eight to 10 exercises, it kind of runs through quite smooth quite quickly um and, and i've also used it just on, on a note of just experience i've used it with novices before although it's a novice program yeah. i generally don't like i find that the form goes to pot a lot 20 reps uh, is a lot like on that um i actually find like uh will whalen and mladen mladen jovanovic has coined this sort of like a badger protocol that's sort of a, a, an iso some reps and an iso uh, and I think that's a little bit better that I give beginners now more yeah. so than one by 20. But I think once you're competent, um, yeah, it's, it's running quite nice. I feel good after it. And yeah. that should set some foundations for the new year then to sort of get back to, to proper training. And yeah. how, how light, how light are you then on your squat pattern and your whatever else it is like after, at your 20 reps, are you, are you smoked or are you, are you still okay? Mm, no, nah, I'm not. 
I like because uh, well, uh, like at the minute I'm using a like a goblet split squat uh, as my as my squat pattern. Like the first day I did it because I'd I'd had pretty much like nearly three weeks off lifting, I was smoked like my quads and glutes mm-hmm. were smoked. But uh, then by the second day, like pretty pretty far, like no muscle soreness really. So mm-hmm. I mean that's the beauty of that plan is is it doesn't really make you you get a ton of blood flow to the area at the time, but you don't get incredibly sore. Obviously, if you were doing like twenty rep back squats with a really heavy weight, like old school Tom Platts, you're going to be crippled. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. Not, not necessarily the idea of the, the program. No. And the cool thing with the one by 20 is if you think about it, like you're going to probably get through a bit more range of motion. You specifically, you're going to get through more range of motion. Um, you're going to be able to, there's going to be much more of a focus on just yielding, like letting, letting muscles go more eccentric muscle orientation rather than activity like you're actually in your squat you're going to be able to breathe through it all of these things and you're going to get back a lot of range of motion around your hips and and your rib cage and everywhere and your shoulders as well if you do it in that way um that's the good thing about going higher reps like basically the threshold i would say where that program stops becoming useful is when people are struggling to breathe under us under a load in in, in that and, and that's why they, that's one of the reasons they get smoked as well the load is obviously too heavy and then they have to brace for the entire 20 reps so it's i think the threshold is where you start to feel like my breathing is really struggling then maybe that's when the 20 reps the one by 20 thing isn't isn't as valid anymore yeah 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 exactly i think and that's one of the things that comes with the experience of, of running the program. That's why I'm a lot, I try, like I also thought it's a good opportunity to run it myself mm-hmm. during this little period because I do prescribe it and I've run it in the past. And it's like, well, actually doing these things, it's, I don't think you need to do everything that you coach necessarily, but I think the more experience you can have, um, it just gives better buy-in to your athletes that, yeah, I've done this, yeah, the, and I found these problems and I understand why he's moaning about such and such and such and such now because you've you've actually experienced it yourself. It's the same as when, when people are competing with anxiety, weight cutting, all of these issues with combat sports. Um, if you've experienced it or you've at least made the, those uh, the walk and done those things, you can kind of, you can have a, a bit of a better connection with your, your athlete and client because mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. um and something that that's why i think like doing the program when your client talks to you about that program you can kind of go well yeah when i did that i found that and and you, you're not just a coach or an authority but you're actually a another human just just conversing about it mm-hmm. do you think your do you think your education has made it easier or harder for you to step in the ring now or into a fight or whatever or harder, harder. Like, like no it's, it's made me a, a much better coach. I was mm-hmm. actually talking about this with my friend it's like uh, before my fight because I knew what I'd done when I'd done it uh, in the injury before the fight. And like, and they were just like, sometimes you just you too you too knowledgeable in that area for your own good. Yeah. You know, whereas someone else would go, oh, bit of an ouchie, you know, crack on and then yeah. deal with the consequences after. Um, so I do think from potentially. Pros and cons. I train. I'm able to train and facilitate training in a very good way now because of it. But at the same time, I would say sometimes in terms of like uh, being aware of consequences, because the education is a little bit more. Um, that's probably a bit of a negative. Yeah, yeah. What? How do you think about? So you're getting you're you're going into a fight, obviously thinking I'm going to try and hurt this guy. How do you reconcile that in your mind in terms of like, especially with head, head injuries and stuff like that is, is it's, it's a bit of a strange question. It's a hard question to ask, but you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, Kier asked the, on Kier's podcast, he has similar things in, in, in that regard in terms of violence outcome. I, I do find when I compete, I just have a switch like in that regard of like, yeah. um, I don't like now when I was younger, you'd have fights outside young growing up lad like you say in the pub wherever or the park whatever you just have that was just growing up right but now like the last thing i ever want to do is really have a fight outside of <laughs> competitive prize fighting you know because i feel like the repercussions of that can be bad um, well it would be bad for the person <laughs> that you're gonna fight <laughs> <laughs> so like i genuinely have you know um that, that and then and i'd say with fighting if, if this is where I, I do have a hard time with things like professional boxing at times because I see fights that are made that aren't competitive matchups regularly. And one guy is just taking a ton of brain trauma 
and the kid, the young prospects punching this guy's head off who never had a chance of winning. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I do have a problem with that. I think fair competition where, where people are both aware of the risks and have signed a contract and it's a competitive fight. Um, it, I see it as competition and, and it, it, you know, it's a byproduct of, of this competition in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, but like I, I do believe in that kind of a, you know you want competitive fights, fair matchups, um, and and then it's a then it's it's fair game then you know mm -hmm. um, of of like I can live with my conscience of we're both going into this knowing no repercussions and it is what it is. Yeah. How um again another tough question for you and, and you'll probably you'll probably go on the humble side but how how far do you think you can go now as an athlete? So when I was younger, I think there was a period where like, I, and, and in my true heart, I believed I'd be like UFC world champion when I was about 22, 23, I was unbeaten, just for everything was falling into place. And then, then that, that period happens where you start breaking down injuries, you're not, you get, I had quite a lot in a quick succession and um, I had like a, a couple of, I had a decision last and then that kind of set me back and, and you're kind of finding your way again. Um, but at that point in time, I feel with the right guidance and that, like I, I was certainly one of the best in Europe. I think I was number three in Europe at the time uh, at the lighter weight. And I was like really on, on track. A lot of people touted me to, to go on to very big things. Now where I'm at, um, I think I could, like, I could definitely get a world title and I, and I could definitely... Um, fight at the highest level in Europe and, 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 and perhaps the world, but the, the goal, my goal is no longer to be like UFC world champion. Um, my goal now is, is to try and be as good as I can be. I guess that's a, that's a switch where rather than being orientated around an, an objective, mm -hmm. now I'm more orientated around, like, I just want to be as good as I can be. And I believe me on my best day can compete with all of the guys. So, so, but, 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 I'm aware of like my limitations and what else I'm doing in my life. And I just want to be able to achieve as much as I can at that point in time, rather than setting a, this is the goal post. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Just see what happens. Just do your best and see what happens. I suppose the, uh, you said, in, you said in one of your Instagram posts, success in MMA is a rare combo of skills, belief, career management, and timing. I suppose the timing is maybe a look part of it. Um, is the look part which of those things do you think you maybe struggle with the most uh skills belief career management and timing what could have been better or all so, of them probably but uh, all of them probably as, as a as a younger man certainly like um i feel like career management and timing perhaps like literally like a a, a a slightly better decision at a period of time and i could have probably been i'd have probably got the call to the ufc at that point in time um and, and you're starting to see it now with guys who are, who are creeping through to the UFC that they're almost taking like a, a safe route to get there. Now, whether that's the best route, I don't know, because if you're not prepared for that level of opposition by the time you get there, you can be out as quick as you're in. So mm -hmm. there's, there's pros and cons to both sides, but certainly career management and sort of like just an overall figure guiding me. You know, like I didn't really have a, I had to, I had to seek coaches. There wasn't like a head coach in our local area who, who had been there and done it and was, was well organized and could run a team now now we've got kind of our first generation of guys who can we have a guy called tom breeze in birmingham who's running team renegade um i'm running our amateur mma setup um we're going to be the first generation of coaches who who are who have been around the world who have competed at a high level and, and can kind of pass on our knowledge but when we were starting out it wasn't there so mm -hmm. the guidance wasn't there i ended up eventually seeking uh, brad pickett in london who was a bit of a mentor, um, but then that had its own consequences of just traveling all of the time, which took its toll. Um, so I'd say like that guiding figure wasn't there for, me, for myself. Yeah. Now with what we have on offer, the, the, only, the only things that I would say that, don't, that I don't have that is, is the, um, the time, the, as, much, as much time to train because of all the other things I'm doing um, and perhaps belief then. Whereas when I was, I don't know what you would call it when I was young. Maybe I was deluded when I was, uh, I see it with a lot of fighters when they're very young. They tend to be just like they're God's gift. They're the best fighter on the planet. They're a bit deluded, mm -hmm. um, very naive of the rest of life. And then as you get older, 
we all kind of get this kind of more realistic, more martial art. I was listening to Dominic Cruz talk recently, and it's you go from sort of the yin to the yang, yin yang. You go to now where we're kind of all about mastery, we're all about ourselves and self development rather than the it being about the ego. Yeah. Um, when you're yep. younger, you think you're unbeatable, you think you're God's gift. And it carries you a hell of a long way. But then when you get to a certain point and things go wrong, which they do, I mean, it's like Conor McGregor now with his situation. He's had, had a hard couple of years and obviously the leg break and stuff. Um, now he's going to have to, if he carries on fighting, he's going to have to fight for potentially different reasons than what he was mm-hmm. when his rise was just through, he was just a constant rise. And um, so I feel like for me now, the missing thing is he's just... Uh, it's a little bit of belief potentially because you're not in the same boat as where you think you're untouchable. Mm-hmm. But um, you also got kind of like humility to know where your weaknesses are, what you need to improve on. And you see it as a bit of a tool of self-development rather than just being uh, egotistical reasons to fight. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, do you think, do you think what's happened recently to Connor has humbled him or do you think he's sm- He's not stupid. Like, is he, you know what I mean? Like he's, he's, he's smart enough. Surely he, Surely he's taken some lessons there, and, and but th- th- then sometimes it doesn't seem like that on social media. Yeah, <laughs> maybe really that's just a show. Because I listen to him talk in interviews, and in interviews he comes across like re- in real interviews, he's very intelligent and he understands very intelligent. The and um, mm-hmm. but then he has his social media and obviously the antics outside of uh, that go on. But a bit of that is you know um, social media, as we said before. Yeah. You know what, what he's shown on social media to. to, to I'm sure deep down he knows what he needs to work on to improve, how he needs to approach fighting now. Is he's in a different position to who he was when he was king of the world? It, it, it's got to be about development, and and or it's got to be just about taking the smart fights to make a load of money, which I don't blame him for either. either mm-hmm. So, uh, well, yeah, I think that's easily the follow where his his social media persona is a little bit different to when you actually hear him talk in front of a camera. He's yeah. very articulate, very intelligent. Yeah, he's he is when you actually get a proper interview with him over the years you can look back to some of his interviews over the years like he takes the fight game serious he takes his training and his body really seriously and you know when people were saying that oh he wasn't training like for the last last few years properly and this and that maybe not but i also find it hard to believe that he was just underestimating opponents and just drinking and doing drugs and not training at all properly like he's he he understands the the sport i think I think as well, people, there comes a point, and I see, I see it with, with the higher end guys in, in Birmingham, in boxing and in, in MMA, where you can't train how you trained at 24, 25, because you're not that age anymore. You've got miles mm-hmm. on the clock, and you, you, you're you still training, but you're not training as intensive, as abusive as you were back then. Obviously, there's, there's two sides of that coin. You, you get some guys like uh, Max Holloway is a good example who doesn't really, he doesn't even spar that hard, like properly hard anymore. He does a lot of situations, but he doesn't spar it, his own words. But it, that can be different interpretations, but he doesn't spar. And he's had a, a great uh, resurgence because of that, because he's not taking the abuse in the gym. Mm-hmm. Vice versa, you could get another guy who doesn't spar and maybe his confidence goes because he's not sparring and he's not mm-hmm. getting in the battle in the gym and, and he has poor performances. So it, it's easy to look in and just go, ah, oh, he's not doing as much sparring anymore. So he doesn't want it, but, but maybe that's what, his body needs who you know that it's very hard from the outside into make assumptions on pro athletes as we all do armchair yeah. fans on a yeah yeah doing yeah. the football and you know yeah yeah 100 oh, percent. I, I worked with a few soccer guys uh well we call them soccer because obviously we have gaelic football but footballers like and people are so critical of them like oh they play a 90 minute game and then they lie on the couch for the rest of the week and it's like they're they're the, the they might play two 90 minute games in a week and they're traveling in between games and all of this stuff and it's like literally all they can do is lie on the couch and people are like oh they I, like i could do that if i was being paid 80 grand a week and this and that I'm like no you could not yeah yeah 100 percent. you know it's so it's just it is an ignorant view it is an ignorant view what um Spar- when do you think your last hard training should be before a fight for you at the moment so for me i i I um I thought before about two weeks. Um, that was after my last fight in Cage Warriors. Um, but I did I sparred this time through um, eight days out. I thought it'd be enough time, and like I picked up a knock 
a pretty bad knock. Um, I feel like once the sort of, um, wh when I start depleting my body from, from a perspective to make weight, I think that's kind of the point where my weight starts to drop a couple of kilo. I think that's the point where I probably need to cease high contact sparring mm -hmm. and, and sort of start. You, there's other things you can do that are high intensity in nature, but perhaps sort of the hard sparring between 14 and 10 days out, I would say, mm -hmm. is a recommendation now. Is, is that is that because you think you're more susceptible to injury at that stage or is it because it just drains you too much or is it both uh both i think you you very sort of if you're on low calorie you're a little bit you're not as sharp mentally you're a little bit lethargic but also for me personally when i get near a weight i'm very very lean um and i do feel like when i'm that lean my injury risk my mm -hmm. injury risk does go up quite substantially mm -hmm. um, you're very lean <laughs> So when you, when are, I get, you are shredded for that fight. So when I get near there, I, for me personally, I find I find like uh, soft tissue injuries go through the roof when mm -hmm. I'm at that at that period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. How's your How's your sleep over the like them few days? Um, I'm actually pretty good. Like we, we've sleep barring the last night before the weight cut where you're a little bit dehydrated, um, like the night before weigh-ins. Um, pretty much sleep sleep decently. Even on low calorie, to be fair. Are you trying to when you're doing your when you're doing your walk? Are you trying to uh, psych yourself up or calm yourself down? This one was a little bit weird. This one was uh, I just felt normal, which was I don't I don't know I don't I don't I, it felt it felt just it did feel very very normal. Um, in the past, I've gone and really psyched myself up way more than I was for this one. Um, so it's it's, it's hard to. I, it felt like a mature performance and like I felt like just kind of like uh it's, it's like uh almost like this is just this is business this is what what we're doing rather than I didn't feel like I needed to be I was obviously way more aroused than on a Monday morning at pro training but not not to the point of like being angry and being yeah. uh which which I think has, has been a again I think that that like I said, I listened to Dominic Cruz talk recently and it was that when you're young, you're angry. You probably, you don't really understand the world. You're clearly upset about something because you've started MMA in the first place. <laughs> and, and, and over the years, you sort of mature and it becomes a bit more zen-like and a bit more mature and martial arts and the martial arts way. Mm -hmm. You looked very calm in that fight because he was wild. I, I don't think I've ever seen a, as wild a fighter. Like, even though you were complete, and again, again, I know nothing about fighting, but even when you were like completely dominating him, I was still on the edge of my seat because I was like, he's so wild that he looks like he could catch you with any part of his body, even though he was not, even though the fight wasn't even that competitive. Yeah, that's what I said to uh, on the pre fight. I, I got it quite right, actually. Like, on the, on the, they did like a pre fight, the embedded video on YouTube, like a countdown and had like like a mini documentary kind of series before the fight and i said i said like nine times out of ten the fight goes one way like it was always oh, I just, i'd believe in my skill set against him but he's very very dangerous as in like i don't think he knew what he was going to do i don't think in uh, 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 those kinds of fighters sometimes can be because most of his wins have come from grappling and i thought well he's never gonna uh cause me troubles in grappling mm -hmm. so the next step is he's just what any on the feet he's just super erratic and like, uh, that's dangerous. It's almost better to fight sometimes someone who's schooled well, like boxing, and you know what's coming. Jab, double jab, backhand, one, two, left. You understand what's coming. It's okay. Mm -hmm. We're playing this game. This is the game, you know. So, yeah, it was very uh, very erratic, but um, got through it in the end, and it's yeah. uh, a solid win for next year. It's like playing poker with someone, you know, the professionals, when you see someone, um, professional plays poker against someone who is, not who's not as good at poker and then they they call a hand that they shouldn't have called or something and they're like what are you doing you yeah, should have yeah. folded that hand it's like you just don't know what they're going to do they're hard to predict um what so here's my here's my generic question so you're going to be trapped on a, on a desert island for a week you do have food don't worry you don't have to cut but you can bring three coaches with you or, or not just not just SNC coaches, but like I, I suppose three. You're not allowed to bring family, but like three people that you'd like to be learned from or influenced by, and you have a full week to learn from them. Who would you Who would you bring? Three. Okay, I, I go. 
it'd be quite funny actually because they they argue with each other on social media. But I bring uh, Dan Cleather, who's the head of my uh, program at St Mary's. Um, he's actually one of the smartest blokes I've ever met. But he has certain viewpoints in certain things. But he's a very very clever guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd also bring Mladen Jovanovic as well because they can argue. I can watch him. I can watch the uh, fireworks. But um, again, another uh, a very good thinker who I've not really had a ton of contact with. So a lot mm-hmm. of the coaches I've sort of uh, we follow each other on Instagram, I think. But a lot of coaches I've got to have real good conversations with. But he's a coach I really respect, and and uh, I feel I haven't had those kinds of conversations with. Mm-hmm. So I'd, I'd bring those two, and I'd probably bring John Danaha from who's a, a skills coach in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and wrestling. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's pretty much just completely reinvented the level of what grappling can be at the highest level and, and what level of detail and coaching we can have. Where have I heard of him before? Because I've heard his name recently. He used to be George St. Pierre's coach back yeah. many years ago, back in like the 2000s. Um, but he's produced Gordon Ryan, who's probably pretty popular right now. Um, and Gary Tony are like two of the best submission grapplers on the planet. Mm-hmm. What does he think differently? Like, what's 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 he changed? Your thoughts on? He's what what he's what he what he's kind of done is, I mean, the big thing he did was he, he really uh, he improved the the leg like game, but across the board, he systemized the sport. He's sort of one. He's gone. What aren't we doing, and what can be exploited? Mm-hmm. So those two things that have come to now they're almost like everyone should be doing them. But back then, no one was in this wrestling and leg locks from a Brazilian jiu-jitsu perspective of like, what are the, what are the holes in what, what's being taught? And it was like leg entanglements, wrestling positions and sort of like a uh, wrestling, um, wrestling positions on the ground as well. Sort of like rock, like things like from college wrestling, putting them into, into jiu-jitsu. And now they're almost like common practice. Like I teach them, but 10 years ago, seven years ago, they they weren't common practices. So completely revolutionized the game there and kind of systemized what we do. You know, like um, I think from even from a business, business strength, conditioning, rehab, um, MMA, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, systemizing approaches, the, the, it's super useful. It's not the be all and end all. And like, that's where the coach comes in, where they can sort of make the adjustments where they're needed on a system. But I think certainly having a, a system to to learn things or to teach things or, or to just run things from um, it's just changed the level of tuition in, in the sport. Cause before jujitsu used to be like, here's a move, here's a move, let's roll. Here's a move. Here's a move. Now we're starting to get teachers approach jujitsu, like people who understand, you know, like if you were to go to like, it'd be akin to, you know, Gaelic football and guys just like, okay, let's have a kick about. Mm-hmm. Well, that's only going to get you so good. But the coaching's always been there in professional sports like that. I and mean, now it's slowly trickling down into MMA and jiu-jitsu where we're having coaches who are who understand how the coaching process, they understand the learning process, and they're starting to apply that to the, the skill set of Brazilian jiu-jitsu or MMA. Yeah, it's phenomenal. I am obsessed with that type of like skill acquisition. Because you can go out and kick a football all day long and you will get better and better and better, but you'll hit a ceiling and like to see coaches that are able to break things down and really accelerate people's learning is, is it doesn't matter what sport it is. It's so cool to see. It's so cool. And there, there are people that like, you should definitely be paying a lot of attention to, I think. That's the thing that I'm more excited about. I'm sort of learning, like trying to look into more now is that kind of thing of skill acquisition. Cause I kind of have some systems in place for, okay, I can get a guy reasonably strong, reasonably healthy and robust that that there's a nuance to it but i've put a lot of time into that but then well for how much better we're going to get them from getting them load stronger not a lot once they're already there but from getting them better technically and understanding how to like like how to coach and create environments that they can learn better that's going to make them a much better fighter in the long run you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um all right i'm excited to um jump on the bandwagon and see your 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 career as an athlete and a coach over the next few years chris um any other thoughts for me are you happy with that no that's really 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 cool i'm, I'm really um humbled that you've asked me on like i say some of your other guests on here are uh, really really well renowned and guys i've looked up to over the years so it's uh it's really cool that you asked me on so thank you uh of course man definitely when we were putting together our list of people um you were one of the first names there so I appreciate someone with skin in the game and someone who is 
open like when i first chatted to you you were very open to hearing ideas and and that might seem now you're starting to see a lot more people talk about that stuff and more people are adopting like some of the things that we were talking about back then but even a few years ago it wasn't like a couple of years ago there was none of that really was on social media no athletes were talking about it, no coaches were talking about what we were speaking about then and um i actually remember hanging up the first call with you and i was like i don't know if he just thought there i was talking shit for that whole like hour <laughs> or whatever and then i didn't hear from you for a little while and then and then we i think we did another session or something and you said you'd, you'd felt some benefits but i realized then that that was just your way of doing things like it's kind of you just took that information went away practiced it and and weren't like messaging me every 10 minutes it was like i'll come back when i think i know what i'm doing and i think i've kind of figured out this information and now i have some questions so um so yeah that was so basically i, I i'm always impressed with your ability to just keep an open mind and and figure things out as you go it is quite funny actually because on the on some of the very like, popular social media accounts now you see a lot of the stuff that basically like is like the work some of the stuff you've done i'm sure i mean as far as i'm aware it's like, it's like pri concepts right to some of it is degree, yeah yep. to a degree but like things like the 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 hit like the the split squats with a shift things like the isometric hamstring isometrics things like just talk about compression and expansion and all those they're like so hot topic it seems in 2021 mm -hmm. there seem to be like every coach is just is talk about it but like you say like you've been doing like talk about this for probably three or four years now maybe even mm -hmm. longer yeah and i don't i don't mean like mm -hmm. i'm i'm the one talking about right inventing any of this stuff not at all just just um it's interesting to see to see that now how, how big it's gotten but um yeah i think people you know, swing back around. I think it you was know, swinging around, of course, you know, all the time. And it's like just remembering that somewhere in the middle ground is probably going to give everyone everything mm -hmm. they need. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because people are now like, you see, you see some coaches now who like learned that yesterday, and now they're teaching it today. Like you know, they they, they never had that period where I'm going to take this information and turn it into knowledge and wisdom. It's now like I I have I found this information now. I'm teaching this information, and um, that 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 doesn't work. It doesn't really work. So, uh, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on social media on Instagram at um, Chris Mayer MMA. That's kind of my main Instagram, sort of uh, my main social media at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and also have a, have a website that's sort of hyperlinked on that. Sometimes I post articles on it. I'm going to start trying to produce a little bit more content next year, just in general, maybe even onto YouTube and things. It's um, trying to juggle a lot of things but i would like to put put some more content out there because generally when i do people like it it's just trying to uh have the time to, to, to put it out there but yeah chris mirror my man instagram is kind of my main thing at the moment yeah and it's more your is your is your content when you're thinking about content now at the moment chris are you more geared towards athletes now you're not talking you're not quite talking to coaches as much yet are you not not in particular so mostly talking to athletes but while i tend to get actually in terms of my remote clients, I actually kind of get a lot of, I probably coach five to 10 coaches, mm -hmm. their s and because mm -hmm. they respect kind of like my opinion. And obviously, and I do the same. I, I've always tended to outsource some of my rehab s &C nutrition because I'm aware of the value of a coach. So like I have a, I had a dietitian from my last fight who's very knowledgeable. Um, and, and it's kind of like, so I'm a believer of that, but I tend to appeal to coaches for some of their programming sometimes. Maybe they coach s and and they do jiu-jitsu and things like that. I tend to find a good percentage of those kinds of uh, mm -hmm. coaches tend to gravitate towards me. Um, but still, most of my content's towards uh, people uh, competing right now. But down the line, that's like down the line with the, with the amateur MMA setup. If I can have, I like to have done something before I offer the services to, to, to support that. But if I can produce what I think I can in terms of like developing some really good amateur fighters, mm -hmm. I would then like to coach coaches on some of the processes we've done there but yeah. that test bed's going on right now so yeah four or five years that's where that can come into play yeah that's where i see your probably big part of your business going in the future is probably coaching the coaches and um it probably satisfy your needs with like coaching some of some athletes i i would say now this is just me talking i don't know what your thought process is but i, I would say i could see you going that direction where you coach some athletes and you tick the you tick the box where that's what you really enjoy doing and then the business is probably probably going to be a mentorship for coaches to because especially as this world gets very 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 big um i think that's where you might end up making some good dosh <laughs>
All right, brother. Thank you very much. Good to chat. Thanks, David. Appreciate you having me on. See you soon, man.